Welcome to the skill session on sequence diagrams. Now, let me be perfectly honest here. A sequence diagram doesn't make any sense without a class diagram. It just doesn't. And you'll see why once we start building one in a moment. So if you don't have a good handle on how to build a class diagram, you need to go back and watch the video before this one, the one that explains class diagrams. With all of that out of the way, it's important to know what exactly a sequence diagram is, what it's good for, what its purpose is. So a sequence diagram is a really detailed view of how you're going to implement a very specific feature. So you're running your, your Scrum project. You're a developer. You're grabbing the next user story and you're trying to figure out how you're gonna build this in the system. You can then start drawing up a sequence diagram to figure out how you're going to make the parts of the application that exist work together in order to get the outcome that you want. Maybe you'll need to add something. That's fine. But that's what a sequence diagram is. It's the it's probably the last level that you can still get non-technical people to approve um, and to still see the idea uh, and the benefit of the way you're implementing things before you turn it into actual code, which is where most people will just um, not understand what you're doing anymore. Well, actually there is a trick to that and that trick is called behavior-driven development, but that's for another time. So without any further ado, let's try creating a um, sequence diagram. When you're creating a sequence diagram, you need to have your class diagram handy because that's basically what your sequence diagram is building upon. So let's say we have a user story now where the user story is that a, um, that a professor needs to be able to add a student to a course. Okay, I'll jump over here, say start, create new diagram, and I'll create a um, sequence diagram. I'll hit create. I'm gonna create a file on my computer. So I'll say library UML sequence diagram. And I have um, an example built right here. So once again, let's dissect this, um, this example. What we have up here up top is our objects. So that means I would expect something inside here that I can recognize in my class diagram. So I'll go over here and say, oh, there's something called a student, a professor, a course. And I know that it's an administrator that would normally enroll people in courses, but I want to keep things simple. So at my school, the professors do it. So what we needed was for the professors to enroll students in uh, classes, right? So I would say then we have a professor who starts this flow. They need to find some kind of a student and they need to add that student to some form of a class or I called it a course, sorry. So professor, student, course, professor, student, course. I don't worry about addresses or animals or anything like that. Uh, this is what I'm working with in this one. And that's a really good example of, because you know, um, class diagrams can grow gigantic. So we're zooming in right now and don't get me wrong, a sequence diagram can grow gigantic as well, but when they do that, maybe you need to ask yourself if, if it's worthwhile. So you have this black dot, that means that this is the beginning of a flow, and we'll use that in, in other diagrams as well. Black dot means start. So this is where we dispatch from. And this is meant just in, as an explanation, and we might as well go through that. From each of these boxes, we have a dotted line that goes down, and then we have a square on that dotted line. And we can have multiple squares on top of each other, next to each other. We can stop them and then have a new one later on, and we'll do that later on. It just means that this is a point where we actually interact. So if this arrow was gonna go all the way over here, then I'd probably want to stop this square just to make it really visible that, that I'm not actually using this class even though it's in between. So here, what's happening is that in the professor class, we're dispatching, which means we're calling a function, we're calling a method on the student class. Then that uh, method, this square is supposed to represent that method in the student class. 
And that method is going to actually call a different function in the professor class. That's why we have another box on top of this box. And that's what's called the callback. So the function that we're calling is calling back to us to ask us something. Then that function on the professor is returning something to the student class, which makes that student function, that student method, capable of returning what it was that the professor asked to begin with. So an example of that could be a professor student uh, communication saying, um, hey student, what class are you in? Um, and then the callback would be, uh, uh, depends who's asking. <laughs> uh, well, it's your chemistry teacher. Oh, okay. It's the chemistry teacher. Well, then I'm in, in, in chem C or whatever. So that, that could be an example of the interaction that's going on here. Of course, we're going to change that in a moment, but I just want to show you that we have these forward lines that are the function calls and you would use the function names or the method names uh, as text here with parameters in them. Only the parameters, not return values because they come later. We can use these uh, dotted lines to show what's returned and then the return would, would show the return types in that. So in the example that I just gave, we could say that that um, that maybe that method would be called um, get um, get course. It might not take any parameters. And then this one would be uh, <laughs> get um, professor profession because maybe that's what's going to define what course it is, then this is going to return a profession, which will allow the student to return a course. And when I write these words with capital start letter, that means that I expect there to be some kind of data type that actually um, has that. So a profession to actually be a thing, a course to actually be a thing. If it isn't, if it's just a string, then I'll, I would just write a string. So what we were asked to do, what I came up with just a second ago was to say that the professor was going to enroll the student in a class. So the professor would probably need to find that student first. And where would they find them? Maybe there needs to be some kind of a school entity. Well, we forgot something back here. We don't have an actual school where people are enrolled in. So, um, so maybe we need to add another class to that, but we don't want to talk too much about class diagrams. So I'll just say right here that that um, that we have a school where we get student, and they probably need some kind of a student ID. Which is a string or actually it's probably an integer. Once they have that, um, let's remove some of all this. Let's make this one smaller. Say uh, that the school is then just gonna return a student. So the student doesn't need to be up here. It's a good starting point, but it doesn't need to be here because we're not actually working on the student. We're working with the student. We're getting the student from the school class from the school class. So maybe there's a school object that contains a list of all the students and we're having one of those students returned from here. Then the next thing we need to do is we need to actually find the course, which is probably also something that the school would have a list of, right? So next thing we're going to do is just say that um, get course. Course ID. We might get it in a different way. We might use some kind of a search or something, but I'm just trying not to overcomplicate things. Once again, we would return the course. Okay, a school can return the course. The 
next thing that's going to happen is then with that course, we're going to do something. We're going to ask that course to enroll that student. So we don't need to start the function call until here. It, we can, we just don't want to run through it, right? So um, here we're going to say uh, on that course that um, actually there was a function right here. We can see it here, add student on course. So add student. And that's going to take a student as a data type. Well, a student of the type student. And I know that a student is of type person, but, but what we write here depends on the implementation, right? So if you want this to be polymorphic, then we could say that student is a person, but we just want to add a student as a student, not as a person. And then um, the course might return something. It might not actually, but uh, let's just say that it does return uh, true Boolean, just to say that this has actually happened. Because this also opens up the door to show something else that we can do in uh, a scenario like this. We can add alternative flows to the same Diagram. This is actually a good little size of a, of a diagram that you can show to someone non-technical and they won't start vomiting all over the place because of the complexity, right? So, um, so, so in that regard, this is a good example. But let's just make it more complex and make them vomit. <laughs> um, so we'll go down here into UML and then we'll want to look for an alternative. Um, so that's what we have right here, a frame. So this frame will let us know that there are two different alternative things that can happen here. Um, so this is um, going to be one alternative and this is going to be another alternative. And so the first one is going to say that we're returning true. And the other one is going to say that we're returning false. Which is also a Boolean. And then we could, you know, uh, make the drawing more complex by, by saying, well, in case that it's returning false, maybe that's because the student is not enrolled in school or th there could be any kind of a problem, right? Um, but then how we're handling that, we could draw that as an alternative scenario down here. So we're saying that it, that this is the primary scenario and this is the alternative to it, right? So, so that would be, you know, the general primary things that you want to do in a, um, in a sequence diagram. So you have your classes up here, uh, or your objects of classes up here. Then you have your function calls with your parameters, and then you have your returns. And each of these are supposed to be a function. So actually, um, this would be two different um, boxes if we are to do this accurately, because that's two different function calls. So this is just one big function doing the whole thing inside of the professor class, it's finding a school or it's asking the school for a student, it's asking the school for a course, and then it's asking that course to enroll that student. And then it might ha it might handle it in some way if, um, if that fails. So that's your sequence diagram. Now a sequence diagram is really good for when you have some complex functionality that you want to make absolutely sure that the non-technical stakeholders or business analysts can take a look at and agree that this is the way we're going to implement this. So that's what it's that's what it's good for. You know, getting from from um, from a sentence or from a description to something a little bit more technical that you can actually implement in code. Um, but there are different ways to show different flows, and in some cases it might be more appropriate to create something like a state machine, 
uh, because we're not so much talking about the actions and the functionality, we're more talking about the different states that the application can be in. It really depends on what exactly it is that you want to implement. Um, but take a look at state machines. They're going to be in the next video that I'm going to link right here.